if an agent knows how to position or deliver value, none of this is, all this is noise. Hello, welcome to episode 208 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. On today's episode, we are joined by President of Authorify, TJ Carinder. With a long career in corporate leadership, TJ joined the Authorify team just prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, changing not only the real estate industry, but also how businesses operate. Throughout our wide-ranging conversation, TJ shares his philosophies on business leadership and employee development. We also dive into how Authorify is helping thousands of real estate professionals grow their businesses and provide real value to their clients. And finally, we touch on his newest venture, Boost Assist, and how agents can better leverage their time with virtual assistants. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, if you or someone else on your team has a story of real estate success or tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new guests to inspire our listeners. And lastly, if you enjoy this conversation and want to hear more, be sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents Podcast. We stream on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and YouTube. All right, let's get on with our conversation with TJ Carinder. If you're interested in learning more about Authorify or Boost Assist, check out the episode description where I've got links to both. All right. Well, really the way I like to start everything out is if you could just introduce yourself to us a little bit, uh, who you are and a little bit about your business background, because I know it's, it's pretty extensive. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't usually love to talk about myself, um, you know, but you, you know, put me on the spot. I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. So uh, TJ Carinder. Um, I currently am the president of Thor Five, but I focus really more on about you know what I'm accomplishing, not more what my title is. And so, I can they call myself the the integrator, which is kind of the executor to make sure that the vision of the company is executed at all levels, from the top line sales all the way down to the delivery of our our product. So, my background, I'll go back all the way. I've been in sales since I was probably 17. I sold grand pianos. I did that from a young age. And then after that, uh, I got into corporate America. And so worked for a Fortune 1000 company for about 13 years and, and worked my way up. And that was in the printing industry. We sold large format printing and software uh, for the printing industry. So I have a depth of knowledge in that field, got out of that field, stayed in a related field uh, and went, became the sales initially and then the president and uh, CEO of a photography company. It was originally a small local business. And then we took it and the vision was to uh, work with the investment group and to scale that. And we did. And so we took that business from being a small mom and pop to a regional size uh, business and then left that and was recruited to uh, join uh, Authorify. And with Calvin, uh, what my vision has been, like I said, is just to help him build and scale this company. And we've done that uh, by having a product that that works for both you know realtors and other professionals that helps them scale and grow their business. So that's that's me in a nutshell. Right. And so over that time, you spent a lot of time in executive leadership positions. And of course, that's what you're doing now with Authorify. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about what you know defines your uh, leadership philosophy? Yeah. So I would look at it this way is, is really fostering a culture of excellence. And I know that's a big buzzword. So I'll, I'll just dig into that a little bit. So I believe in consistently evolving and establishing new benchmarks and goals. And what that means is I spend a lot of my time developing new practices and processes to improve the overall product. So they would might, one might call that a transformational leadership style. Uh, but then I expound upon that and I want to build a system of rewarding the users and the employees in that success. So as the company sees success, so do our people. And so they are buying into the vision from the top down because they see it not only rewarding them in their career and their development and giving them advancements in that, but also allowing them to reward in the success monetarily. And so that's kind of how I found foundation of my, my style of leadership. Was there anything in your uh, previous experiences with uh, other companies or even here that has, um, you know, that was kind of like one of those defining moments that kind of set you down the path of wanting to be that style of leader? Yeah. So bad leaders. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can tell you, I learned more from bad leaders and how not to lead 
And I saw firsthand how that poor leadership made me feel. I remember one time, you know, there's, I'm not going to get into all the details, but there was an opportunity for this leader to do the right thing. You know, I, I stood up to them and, and said, Hey, I don't really think this is the right way we should be handling this. It's not, you know, professional. I think we should do this another way. And they went the path of essentially, a be, you know, pounding leadership, um, aggressive. And instead of actually listening, taking the advice and kind of developing a strategy behind that, um, I just saw how that made me feel. And I vowed never, ever to do that and do the opposite of that in my style and my leadership and reward people for, you know, you think about it, somebody brings a suggestion that says, hey, there's a way we can do things better. And you, you squash that, you're going to end up with people that never have new ideas and never innovation. And they're never going to come to you because you're not listening to what they have to say and establishing and kind of a, a, a narrative of where you could go with the company. And so that's really what defined me is, is, is bad leadership and taking that and saying, I never want to be that. Yeah. And so uh, with that, you know, um, some of the, you know, the big philosophies or, you know, for leadership is, you know, you're people first leader, uh, but then, you know, you want also need to be, um, you know, goal oriented and driven for the company. So how do you blend the two to have that, you know, relationship with the, uh, the employees of the company to foster that culture, that ideas are being, you know, brought to the table and innovation is happening while also focusing on, you know, growing the company at the same time. So I look at it this way. Company is really, if you think about it, it's just a group of people working together toward a common goal. So, you know, you think of business is simply just people and customers are people, clients are people, employees are people. Employees want to be a part of a company that has a strong set of core values and that they can make a difference. So if you allow them and you empower them to make a difference, so, so simply hiring great people, giving them the vision, and then getting out of their way and letting them work, letting them do what you hired them to do. I heard something the other day and someone says, you know, you wouldn't hire an Uber and then jump in the wheel and say, I'm going to drive. I mean, just the analogy of that alone kind of hits the hair, the nail on the head and saying, listen, this is how we develop a strategy where you're hiring great people. You're getting out of the way. You're giving them the autonomy to make decisions. And then if there's an adjustment that needs to be made, you make the adjustment. But you're working within it and creating this culture that people that want to succeed. I look at it like a football team. Imagine you, you got a, this, this football team and, and they're all working together. But then you, you know, you have everyone knows kind of you, you have certain you know, positions there. And let's say that one's supposed to make that tackle and the linebacker just simply doesn't make the tackle. And he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And you don't think that the lineman is going to come back and say, hey, man, what are, you, what, are you, what are you doing? Why aren't you stepping up? Why don't you? They, people want to be a part of that winning organization. And then, you know, you see some football teams or organizations that are always successful. I think like Green Bay Packers. I don't know if you're a Packers fan, hopefully you're not, but, you know, I'm a Bills fan. But you have this, um, you know, there's Green Bay Packers or the New England Patriots, right? They're almost always there. And there's a reason for that. They created this culture of excellence and that people, you know, almost push each other. And you imagine an employee pushing another one and say, Hey man, you can't, you can't just not show up and be ready and prepared. You, hey, Hey, wait a minute. You didn't deliver that. Well, you said you were going to get that ready for me. You didn't do it just like a football player. Hey man, you can't not be there and make that tackle, man. There's a running backs coming through the lane. You got to be there. That's your spot. That is you. You're supposed to be in that lane and, 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 and tackle him. And I think that's, how you create that environment of, you know, people working together and working, you know, and had taking pride ultimately in their, their ownership of, of what they do. Because if you think about it now, like a team, they stand side by side and they fight during the tough times because you're going to have tough times. And then they're able to celebrate when there's really good times. And so that's, that's, I guess, how I would, I would define that. Right. And, and for a company like Authorify, I mean, it's well over a hundred uh, employees now, but it's primarily remote all over the world. So how does, you know, creating that uh, culture and that, you know, that kind of um, uh, teamwork, how, what are the challenges when it is, you know, almost fully remote? 
And I look at it this way, it's not really much different than a non-remote company. So think about the traditional company. There's commute time, right? So there's a reality of you know driving 30 minutes, some cases an hour. And so you might have difficulty finding the perfect talent because someone doesn't want to drive an hour, but they're the perfect position for you. But they're going to find something closer because of stress. There's studies that have been done that show that the stress of traveling in traffic on the way to work actually has a detrimental effect on work performance and efficiency. So you have that. And, and then you have wasted time on long lunches and you have, you know, office chit chat. I can't tell you how many times I, I've been, you know, ign- you know, annoyed by people coming up and, and wanting to chat and talk during a business hour. Say, Hey, man, I'm, I'm focused. I got to get something done, but you don't have those in, you know, a remote workstation. So if you can establish and hire the right people, because not everybody is really designed to work remotely. They need that pushing or that manager saying, Hey man, you're going to get up. It's, it's seven o'clock. You need to, you need to start work. So, and then you can start to leverage technology and think of all the technologies we have that, you know, obviously zoom became a household name during COVID. So everyone's using zoom. You can see the whites of their eyes. You have the ability of using communication tools like Slack. I don't hardly send emails anymore. Slack has eliminated that. I go through my day and maybe I have most of them are solicitation emails. And so I might have four or five emails a day that I specifically need to respond to because everything internally in communication is going through Slack. Um, and then you can collaborate uh, with daily huddles. So honestly, I believe that we are not at a disadvantage being remote. We're in an advantage in today's technology and being able to use that technology to our advantage. So I, I think it's really helped us. Yeah, I know. I mean, for me personally, when we went, you know, remote, it allowed me to really like focus in on the project I was doing rather than hearing, you know, sales calls in the background or anything else like that going on. Oh, yeah, it's annoying. I mean, you got to you, you can really focus uh, a lot better. And I get a lot more done because my my mornings are completely, you know, by myself. You know, I start work usually around seven, seven thirty. And you know, nobody really bothers me until the slack starts hitting me around nine thirty. So it's really nice. Yeah. Uh, You know, as you've been uh, with Authorify, you know, we've obviously been through, you know, COVID hit and that uh, totally like shook up the whole, you know, real estate landscape, but then business landscape as well. Uh, How do, what do you do and how do you stay, you know, uh, ahead of the curve, you know, with your leadership style and, and make, and ensuring that, you know, those core values to your leadership style stay in place as industries change and just kind of the, the entire, uh, ecosystem, uh, regarding, uh, the workplace changes over time. Yeah. I would sum that up probably with one word. You have to adapt. So if you think about an entrepreneur, you know, let, let's go back a little bit and, I'm going to date myself because some of these things, if you think about someone that's created a great product, you know, let's think of Blockbuster, let's think of Sears, let's think of Radio Shack. Those were household names 20 years ago and they're irrelevant now because they weren't willing to adapt to the changes that were happening in the industry around them. And so going back to my management philosophy of more transformational leadership is you have to consistently and constantly reinvent yourself and your company and in order to remain relevant and deliver value and offer value to to your clients. And so if you're not delivering value, they'll find someone else that is. I mean, you may be at the top of your game, like Blockbuster. I mean, everyone was going to Blockbuster and Sears. It was a household name. That's where you went when you were buying, you know, rather it was, you know, yard stuff or, you know, it was a new refrigerator. Now it's Best Buy. Now it's online. And and so they didn't really change or adapt with what the industry was doing. And so I say you can even look not only at what your industry is doing, but what's going on in just the you know the regular market itself, whether it's AI and transforma- transformation there, and really say, okay, how do I keep ahead of that? How do I stay ahead of that and maintain relevance and vitality in that? And so I think that's really what we have to do and what we're constantly doing, you know, whether it's research and development on new products and, you know, new visions. And that's where I get from Calvin. I'm at, I, I love working with Calvin because he's so, 
involved in the product. And, and he's constantly talking to me and saying, hey, wait a minute, what if we did this? How can we expand this? What if we delivered more value over here? Can our, would our customers be better served if we did this? Would we get them better results if we did this? I mean, those are conversations I'm, I'm having pretty much on a daily basis with Calvin and our leadership team to move our company forward. So I hope I answered your question, but I think we're constantly summing it up with one word and that's adapt. Right. And you know, you, you kind of really led into this next set of questions pretty well. Uh, you know, with Authorify, the primary customer base over the years has been, you know, real estate agents. Um, and how's your role at Authorify and your, you know, previous, uh, you know, executive leadership's roles? Uh, how, what have you found to be some of the invaluable advice that you uh, share with uh, people in the real estate sector that are looking to grow their businesses? So here's what I say. I would say run it like a business, not a hobby. So, I mean, we, we meet with tens of thousands and work with tens of thousands of agents and we are counseling and coaching them every single day. And there's a couple things that we see. Majority of them treat it like a hobby. It's, you know, a second business. They're going to try it, see if it works. It's a backup and that's just not going to work. And so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So if you're going to run like a business, Traditionally, what you see is a lot of them will come in and they'll say, I'm going to invest in marketing when I close this deal. When I get my commission, I get my commission from this deal, I will call you guys and I'm, I love your program. I'm going to invest. And I can't tell you how backwards that is and mentality. So think about a traditional business. I'll break this down like, you know, a small, everyone can understand it, a small pizza business. So you got a pizza business. And you want to start it. What's the first thing you have to do? You have to get customers in the door. You open the door, you get, you start making pizza. You got to have a good product, but you got to get customers. You got to run coupons. You got to run sales. You have to acquire customers. You have no one knowing where you're going. You might get a sign. You see them on a sign on the side of the road. Hey, free pizza. Buy one, get one free. You're trying to get customers. So what is that? That's called the cost to acquire a customer. A traditional business model. They set aside a certain amount of money to acquire that customer. That's what realtors don't do. That's what the real estate industry is totally missing. Now, what you should do in establishing it, you break this down into four different areas. It should be number one, how much you spend in marketing. Now, when by marketing, I mean going out and get generating leads. That's your cost to acquire me. If I'm going to be in the market to buy or sell a home, you're going to have to acquire me and that's going to cost you. Just like at the pizza joint has to go out and run coupons and ads and sales and, you know, whether it's banners or whatever he's doing in order to bring customers in. And it costs him money to do that. Then you have your sales expense and your sales expense is going to be how do I market and advertise the home I found and I list it. They confuse those two and they say, well, I'm spending money on marketing. No, you're spending, spending money on sales expense. Not on marketing. Did you market yourself? Did you generate leads? And did you spend money on your own personal branding? And none of them, majority of them that we meet on a regular basis, I would say more than 80, 85% are not doing that, not in that format. And then they have to plan on thirdly is going to be taxes, you know, finance and taxes. And then last, they're going to say, okay, that's the money I have left over. And it's going to be probably 30 or 40% margins. Now, in the traditional business world, if you told me I have got a product where you can sell it, and you'll make 30 or 40% margins, I'd be like, put me in coach. I'm ready to go. That is a great profitable business. But real estate, they look at it completely opposite and they say, wait a minute, I'm giving up 60%. I have to, spend. it's a, it's a mindset. And until you get your mindset right and thinking, this is a business, I'm going to run it like a business. That's the only way you're going to be successful. So if I was to sit here and advise a realtor in today's market, I would say, First of all, run like a business. Secondly, break it down and say, what is my niche? You know, you can't be everything for everyone. Like you can't, you know, focus on FISBOs and focus on, you know, uh, listings, focus on buyers and focus on expireds. And I want to be undivorced. And like, you're just trying to be everything for everyone. Unless you have a full team and you don't have that yet. Maybe you don't. So, so niche down, they tell you riches are in the niches. I don't know how many times we've heard that, right? So let's, let's start with a niche and really get good at that before we start being master of everything, right? And trying to see that, you know, we can do it. And then we go and start attacking the market. Where do I want 
to focus, you know, the market? How am I going to market? Go at it. And then we start to look at how am I going to beat the competition? And then how am I going to learn from the competition, right? Because the competition, you're going to see, you're going to watch them, see what they're doing. And then you're going to say, okay, how am I going to learn from my customers? What are my customers telling me? What are the feedback? What can I do better? How can I improve? You know, what can my feedback and follow up be uh, from all of that? And then how am I going to build my team? Because I want to develop a engine, a business. And so instead of thinking about it as just me, eventually I'm going to have team members. I'm going to have a virtual assistant. I absolutely have to, if I'm free of my time, have a virtual assistant. I might have multiple virtual assistants. I'm going to have team members behind me. I'm going to build a team that's going to be engine. I'm going to build a business, not a hobby. And so that's where I would, I would start if I was working with uh, um, a real estate today. Right. And, you know, obviously uh, the real estate um, landscape and industry as a whole is going through some pretty big changes, you know, right now at the time that we are uh, doing this, um, you know, what do you, what do you foresee in the real estate industry as some of the, the bigger trends that might be changing? And then how is Authorify uh, leveraging, you know, their products and their services to, uh, you know, uh, you know, better prepare for when some of these changes do occur. So, you, yeah, there's, I think you're probably referring to NAR, obviously right. the NAR settlement. Um, I could get into that, but I, I'll, I'll focus maybe a little bit more on the key word that I want to say here is delivering value. We talked about that earlier. If an agent knows how to position or deliver value, None of this is, all this is noise, right? Because think about when you're going and buying a home and you, you're in the marketplace and you really need a home, you don't know the community. Let's say you're moving to a new area. You don't know the community. You don't know the zoning laws. You, you don't know the, the, all the details behind the taxes and the infrastructure in the community. Are they regentrifying the community? Is there going to be an area where you're buying, you know, maybe it's not so nice today, but it could grow and you have a appreciation. If you, you don't know any of that stuff, if you're new, that's why you need a realtor. They're valuable if you're buying a new home. And so on the buyer side, you know, you absolutely have. So you have to position your value. You know, they start eliminating buyer's agents and you've got a big gaping hole of people that don't have representation. You need that. It's like not having an attorney and going in to a court case and you don't have anybody representing you, having your best interest in heart, you're going to overpay. You're probably going to buy on a bad market, right? So there's a lot of changing in this. So uh, we can touch on more on the NAR issue and why I think that is not, uh, in long term, it is an issue, but it's going to just reshape and turn in kind of, you know, a more value positioning for buyer's agents. We'll get into that later, but we talk about emerging you know, kind of trends in the marketplace. I, I would say what's going to change, I think number one is going to be like VR, virtual reality uh, is probably going to be something big, you know, augmented reality. I saw something the other day where people were, were basically going in. Actually, they did it to me. They said, hey, you want to you look at this house? I'm in Florida. I have an opportunity to move to Tennessee for a few months. They send me a link. I walk through it. It's like I'm literally there on my phone and I'm navigating through this house. I can see everything about the house and I never had to show up. Big power in that, right? So I think that's one of the emerging trends you're going to continue to see. Um, I think personalized marketing and using AI for that is another thing because people want to hear their own name and they love it. And so when you start having people personalize you for what you're, you're not only your name, but your, um, you know, kind of your trends, what your community, what your likes, what your interests are, and kind of using that to communicate with you. I think that is going to be another trend. Co content, content is kind of a dominating and delivering more value. When I mean by content, people just throw out content, but I, and then they try to like get something out of you. I think you need to be delivering content with the intent that it delivers immense value with nothing in return. Then people really want to do business with you. So, and then I believe localized marketing, community engagement, to going to my point that the buyers need to know what the community is going to be like. And so if you, people don't really buy houses, if you think about it, they're really buying homes and they're buying into the community. And so if you can develop, rather it's customized videos that really show the community and what it's like to walk down the street when they're not there and they don't know it, 
that's going to be a big value add as they go in your, whether it's Instagram or YouTube or any of your channels and they see what's going on in that community and makes them more apt to want to purchase in a home in that community. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, um, with what Authorify specifically, uh, you know, has, has offered with the, uh, the book program and everything else, uh, you know, that the, there's the value that you're able to add to somebody that is, you know, new to, uh, the selling of a home, or if they're a first time home buyer, there's the, the first, you know, the first time home buyer book. So there's so much stuff, uh, with what Thorify creates that is positioning you as that, you know, valuable resource. Yeah. So think about it. You know, we talked about why realtors are needed. So let's, let's establish that. So, you know, again, we talked about the buyers, even if you're a seller, think about the one thing that you, you need, you need an expert, you need someone with knowledge. So how do you position yourself as someone that is an expert with knowledge better more than a book, right? So, you know, think about all of the leaders that you have seen that have written a book on the subject and it instantly gives them credibility that they must know something on the subject. They must know something on the community and the market that they're representing. And that's what the power of a book delivers. You know, we've heard it over and over again. People buy from who they know, like, and trust. And trust is almost instant when you have someone of credibility in a book that you have. So that's, that's really where you can see the, the layout. And, and I'll expound upon that if we've, you know, I mentioned earlier, we're, we're dealing and coaching with thousands of realtors every single year. And we've seen kind of a couple different things. I think I'll just share with that that I say almost unique is there's really two different types of, of, of realtors that are at the top, right? People that are excelling and hitting it. And we either see number one, they spend an absolute boatload of money on marketing. Right. Rather, it's, you know, in paid ads and generating. And I'm not talking about marketing like we talked about for, you know, sales expense. I'm talking about where they invest in themselves and promoting a listing. Then you see agents that really do a good job at brand on YouTube and Instagram and online. And to me, this is the holy grail of marketing because branding is what happens when someone says, all right, let me Google TJ Carinder Realtor. What comes up? What does he look like? And all of a sudden, the first thing I see on the first page is everything related to, he's written a book on, on m- multiple subjects. He has got a very good presence on social media. He's doing the YouTube. He's got a, he's got a brand. And so I instantly have trust and credibility. This is someone I should respect. This is somebody I should understand. Now, the opposite of that is I Google and I see nothing. He hasn't done anything. There's no SEO. There's no support. There's nothing going on in his brand. And so I'm like, eh, maybe I'll hold back. Maybe I shouldn't take a meeting for this guy on a listing appointment. And that's where I think you establish instant trust with the book. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I want to touch on uh, the book and the fact that it is, you know, it, it it is printed media. And for so long, we've all heard, you know, oh, print media is dying. It's, it's everything's going digital. Why is print media is at the cornerstone of Authorify's offer? So I'll back up a little bit, talk about print media and why, you know, going back, let's say probably more than 10 years ago, I was in a, we'll call it a group study uh, round table with, you know, individuals where they went through and kind of professionals said, Hey, listen, Gartner, uh, IDC, these are, you know, studies that they would they had done on the industry and they said wow if you guys don't evolve you're going to die i mean that was just to the point they said the print industry is changing everything's going to be you know going to meet uh, digital and if you guys don't develop and we have seen a shift of that toward you know from t- traditional printing you know nobody really prints in the office anymore to a more ship the digital. But the thing is, in recent years, COVID kind of changed a lot of that even even recently. So the industry is not really seen. There's been kind of three or four areas where the industry has not seen a decline, it's actually seen an increase. And number one has been in packages and labeling, you know, because that is everyone is shipping on buying and stuff online. So packaging and labeling is going way up. 
And so now you're seeing a shift to that. So instead of being printing, traditional printing in the office, which people aren't doing anymore, it's going to packages and labeling. And then you're seeing photo printing. I think they've seen, and they're projecting a continued increase of like 8% all the way through 20, 2032 in printing. Now, let me tell you why. I'm talking about photo printing. Is because you have this, right? You have your little iPhone. And if you think about an iPhone, and the you now always have it on your phone. But in the absence of that, you don't have it anywhere else. And so what happens is when you start to lose that touch, people want it more. They want it on the wall. And it has a lot more value when you're seeing it less. It actually took the opposite approach to what people thought. They thought, oh, it's going away. Nobody's going to do it. They're not going to want it. They're going to have it on their phone. And they're like, no, I, I actually don't just want it on my phone. And now they're seeing an increase in photo printing, whether it's Shutterfly or any of these other, you're seeing a large increase in that. And so that's another thing we're seeing. And then we're seeing direct mail take an absolute increase where people are, and we see this in Authorify, where they're actually mailing magazines and mailing uh, books. That took a huge increase when we went into COVID. And I'll explain why. It's, it's because you weren't allowed to walk into a customer's home. So just, just think about that a minute. So, Michael, you're an agent and you have no ability to walk in. They're telling you for two years, you're not going to be able to walk in. You're going to have to wash your hands 55 times before you do it. I mean, it was crazy stuff. You wear 20 masks or whatever it is. And, and <laughs> we're not allowed to do this, 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 and this. And so people were like, ah, what are we going to do? So what did the people do? They mailed the book. And that's how their face and their information, and they basically transformed walking into the customer's home in the form of a magazine or a flyer or a book. It was huge. And so that's why we've seen books as the final piece that has grown. Now, people say, well, nobody's who reads books. Actually, that's the opposite. Books have grown by 13% in 2021. Now, that's not just you know digital books. That's printed books. So going back to my style, there's a big change right now. And I think it's going to continue to shift this way as people are trying to freeze away from, they're like, I want to get away from the digital, I, you know, blue screen. And, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, just kind of detox from all of that. And so books, actually physical books, the printed book of just sitting down and enjoying it is actually on the rise. And so that's why we're seeing our sales continue to go up. Because people are being able to find ways to get into the home, to get into the family's home with books and media, and they're capitalizing on the rise of people who are wanting to get away from digital and actually detox and enjoy and sit down and read printed media. So we're seeing that change. Yeah. And I think it's also, you know, with having a uh, something physical, you are, you're staying memorable because I don't know how many... Um, you know, sports publications or whatever it is that maybe I used to uh, get a, a printed magazine subscription to or a newspaper and they went, you know, they were like, okay, you know, print media is dying. We're going all digital. Yeah. And then once it became just like this email link, I stopped subscribing because it went to my email and died because I never looked at it. And then I was like, why am I paying for this? Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, it, it, it really evolved and I, I'll use I, I still buy the physical book. All the time, because, you know, I, you get to like, look at what, how much is being sent to you every day in email. I would say, and then I, I have that, I maybe read the first column and I never scroll down. So I'm not, I'm not consuming the content. So I'm getting it. I maybe open it. They look at it and say, well, he opened it. He read it. No, I didn't. I, I didn't even look through half of it. And, and, but when there's a physical book and I see the cover. And I actually see value in the book and I can read something that's relevant to me in my market. And then I actually can see someone that maybe the book is customized to my, to my market, to something that I'm interested in, whether it's buying and selling, and maybe it's a, a, a niche. We talked about that earlier. I believe niching down is the only way to, to really, you know, get riches and, and, in, in any industry, you have to be able to niche down. You can't just be everything for everybody. And that goes specifically for, for agents. Eventually they can, they can branch out, but they need to start focused on a real powerful niche and they'll be successful. So, so yeah, I, I believe strongly in the value of, of book and, and where it's headed. And you can see based upon not my feelings, but the industry is saying it's going to grow into 2020, 2030. 
Right. And then, you know, even beyond the books, Authorify offers a whole lot of other things. Uh, technologically speaking, um, you know, it's, you know, in the real estate and lead generation, it, you know, the book is that deliverable, but Authorify also provides lead generation websites and different things that you would have to go out, you know, and either build yourself or contract out with somebody else. And that's all part of the, uh, the program. Yeah. So I, I look at it as an omni channel kind of approach. You think of, you know, when, when you hear the word omni channel, you're kind of thinking of, you know, brick and mortar, you know, realist, you know, um, like retail. But really, it needs to be broken down just like that from a, a real estate standpoint. So imagine if you've got a client and you want to attack them, you're going to start with the physical. Right. That's got the most tangible value. So you start with the physical. What did we just talk about? Books, magazines, flyers, guides, all of that are important. And then you break it down. Now you have digital, right? So you can take cons concepts or snippets from your guides and books. And now you piecemeal that content that's all created from us and generated and put that into email, SMS, voice memos, digital you know, uh, rather it's, you know, uh, Facebook or any of the, the platforms. And then you can combine that with human telephone calls, whether it's you or using a third party um, to make calls on your behalf. Uh, you can do paid ads. You know, you can do uh, retargeting. All of that we have on our platform. So retargeting, if someone's not familiar with that, is when someone interacts with your content, then you can redisplay content as they navigate through the web. That's the short version of how that works. Um, and if you want to know more about that, we can talk more about that as our, as our you know, full platform. Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to, you, you talked about, um, you know, having people make calls on your behalf and, and, uh, virtual assistance is a huge, you know, especially for a real estate agent that does not have a, a big team behind them or a support, you know, staff behind them. Um, having a VA is a huge help. Tell me about, uh, boost assist and what that is. Cause that's a, it's a pretty, uh, new offering underneath this, uh, entire umbrella. Yeah, that's a great story. So, um, I'll tell you how that came about. I mean, Thorify has not really been in the VA business. And, and so Boost was kind of birthed, if you were born, maybe it's a better word, from customer involvement. So, you know, I was having a call with a customer and one of our largest clients, and he was generating and printing a lot of books and mailing them, doing some of the services I talked about earlier. And he basically said to me, why, why can't a Thorify do this for me? I mean, I don't, I don't have a time to do this, TJ. I want to mail these books out. They're effective. They work. I want to mail all this stuff out. Can, can a Thorify do this? If I just say, hey, mail these to these 10 clients, mail these to these 100 clients. I, I want to do that. And I said, well, you, we, I'm sure we can figure something out. Let, let, me, let me dig into it. And that's how it was born. And if you think about it, you know, having a, a, a VA is essentially taking whatever you spend all day doing and try to find someone that's better than you at it and delegate it. That's just the net rub. So you can focus on the big picture. So you can focus on where you need to go. I mean, if you're, if you're, if a realtor is best when he is in front of a client presenting a list and presentation, why should he be doing anything else? And so you can maximize your time, eliminate all the, the $10, $15, $25 hour stuff to your VA, have them handle all of that. And you focus on, as they used to say in the sales business, to be belly to belly with the clients, right? So you're talking to them and communicating and having this conversational you know, transportation and closing more deals. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, hiring on a VA and, and doing that. I think uh, so many people, ha they have a hard time figuring out, you know, okay, how am I, how am I going to start delegating? Because, you know, if you've built this business and you have like these certain processes that you've done and it, it can be hard to hand over some of those processes, but I think it, it really is important uh, for people to sit down and kind of map out what their, you know, what their schedule for their day is, how much time do they spend doing these things that can be offloaded to somebody else? Yeah. So that, that, that is the hard part with them. And that's the fear is like, okay, if I give it to someone, are they going to mess it up? 
You know, if, if I tell them to send an email, are they going to send the wrong one? That I think is what we hear most about. Well, that's why you look at working with someone like a Thorify, because we have already through trial and error created the processes, the procedures and the efficiencies of what should be done with an agent. We know how they should communicate. We know how they should work. We've trained them. We've developed them. We've coached them. And so you're actually getting an agent or an, uh, a VA that, that is ready to go as soon as you move forward. And then we coach you on how to work the best with them. And so they can do a lot of different things. And if you want, I can get into, you know, each one of those, uh, kind of how they could work with you. So, you know, if you think about a VA, your whole ultimate goal is to provide, you know, leverage. So to get some of your time back. And so you're not, focusing on, like we said, those little things. And so what are some of those things that you would probably want to, uh, you know, maybe delegate? I would say number one would be social media. Like, I mean, those are things that if you have a plan and we develop that with you, we, we have automate, automated plans that you can do and you work with our VA and it's ready to go. So social media, you can do SDR, that's outbound calling. Maybe they're one you want to do appointment setting or you want to do uh, research. You can do skip tracing. You can do CRM, you know, data management. Um, let's, let's see, uh, running comps. It's another one. Uh, managing your emails. Uh, you know, following up on clients to so say a client comes and you want to answer that call right away, but you're in another listing appointment. Who's going to make that call? Your VA will. And you train them and you let them know how you want to respond and do that. And then they have a weekly meeting with you and they're working with you and they can handle all of your event management. Maybe you have certain events like open houses and things like that. And you want them to manage that. You want them to communicate and follow up with all of your people that attended the open house and your calendar management. They can do all of that behind the scenes. And that allows you to really be in front of your clients, developing and making the most out of your time. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, it's really great that, you know, with, with boost assist, uh, you know, you guys are, you're vetting out and bringing down these VAs and then the actual, uh, the agent and the client, you know, is, is going through the the training process and really getting them up to speed on their uh, business as well. And I think that's really important and really beneficial for agents that, um, maybe you've never done the VA thing or have, you know, tried to hire somebody out themselves, that whole vetting process and getting the right you know, person that can be a good VA that, that can take a little while to find the right type of people. And boost is already doing that. Yeah. So, I mean, everyone knows in business, the hardest thing you're going to have to do is hire and train and develop and manage employees, period. It's why this most frustrating thing that people have. They say they, most people never make the leap from individual contributor to a manager. Why it's managing people. It's the emotions, it's the challenges, it's the, uh, the keeping them on task, making sure they're held, held accountable. That is the toughest thing because, and nobody sat there and taught people how to do it. So that is the most, we've eliminated the problems. You don't have to worry about finding the talent. You don't have to worry about training the talent, developing the talent. All you do is work with us. You tell us what you want them to do and they do it. You eliminate all the problems. It is a win-win across the board. And so that is why we're seeing huge gains in this um, boost assist. And I, I consider that to be one of our, our, our biggest opportunities uh, for the agents and the helping them expand their, uh, their business in the, in the future. Awesome. Well, before we wrap up, uh, for somebody that's listening to this, where can they find out more about boost assist if they're, you know, something that they want to explore for their own business? Yeah. So they could go to boostassist.com. Uh, so that would be the first place they can register there. We'll reach out to them. We'll contact them. We'll do an assessment of what their needs are. We have specific plans designed for them. So if they want one just for social media, we can do that. If they want one for social media. Plus they want someone to make outbound calls. We can do that. We can customize it for their needs. Um, so yeah, go ahead and reach out to us, schedule a time with one of our marketing consultants, and we'll walk through and kind of coach them on what uh, is necessary and what they need. Awesome. I appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with us today. All right. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. I want to thank TJ for joining us today. And remember, you can learn more about becoming a market authority by going to authorify.com or how you can better leverage your time with a virtual assistant at boostassist.com. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story of real estate success or tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. 
Well, that wraps things up for this episode. But remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.